All right, welcome back, Cohort 5. We're in our last recorded meeting. Andrew and all of us will be talking about Chapter 10, but also kind of probably anything goes. And yeah, let's go there. Andrew, however you want to proceed. Yep. Sure, yeah. I'll just give a quick kind of summary of this chat i cannot give an entire holistic summary of this chapter because as we know it, it's the longest chapter in the textbook um and one of its key themes is to describe active inference as a basically a kind of complete solution to sentient organisms adaptive problems which attempts to provide a unified perspective on action selection perception attention emotion or regulation a variety of other cognitive mechanisms. Um, so it's, it's, it attempts to give us, I think, a kind of like, let's round out the textbook here. Let's, let's, let's go over in section 10.2, all of the previous chapters up to this point, give a quick summary, like kind of in a per paragraph approach for each chapter, reminding us of anything from Markov blankets to neurobiological substrates, message passing, uh, building models, and so on. Um, section 10.3 quickly mentions this, uh, the, the famous uh, philosopher Daniel Dennett, his suggestion to model the whole iguana uh, was, the, was the quote. And that's more or less what active inference attempts to do by using free energy minimization as a sort of first principle by which we can derive implications for a variety of cognitive processes. Um, it takes a kind of inactive integrative approach to, to behavior, to preference realization, self-evidencing, self-preservation, autopoiesis. Um, it does not separate entirely action and perception as is done in uh, or has been done at least in different um, neuropsychological uh, approaches and uh, yeah it just attempts to yeah just take a very integrative view don't view action and perception as totally separate don't view memory and attention as completely separate planning prospection retrospection all of these things are are tied together by way of a free energy minimization. And then from there, for anyone who's, you know, more, more focused upon sort of the, the neural and neurobiological substrates and underpinnings, neural signatures, getting into neuroimaging data, then it, it might just be the case that we're looking at different pathways uh, for each of these things, but nonetheless, they're, they're sort of of a piece. Um, and before I, I wrap up this this summary. I mentioned I I noticed at the end of section ten point three, they mentioned um, uh, they reference this this great neuroscientist uh, up at NYU, Yori Busaki, who's kind of famous for um, back around two thousand six, I believe two thousand four two thousand six. Um, talked to, began talking about this kind of inside out approach to studying the the brain and how the cognitive and psychological sciences have sort of inherited all of these um, Jamesian, William Jamesian uh, categories in, in how they understand the, the mind, the, the mind brain connection and so on. So these were even these very words that we're using uh, memory and planning and emotion uh, you can just flip open like one of James's like key books that's been used as a foundation in many psychology and neuroscience courses and just, yeah, look at its table of contents. And we have so many of these, these words that, that are continuing to be used in a very, sometimes very free floating kind of way uh, in, in current research. Um, what does memory mean? uh what what is attention exactly and uh yeah so it's it, it's not to say that all these jamesian categories should be you know eliminated uh from from the sciences or you know rejected or even 
uh, supposed to have, you know, zero value. They have plenty of heuristic value, but uh, it's just, it's an interesting take to try and use what we know now about neurobiology, about computation, mathematics, and yeah, just maybe it's time for the, the cognitive sciences and others to kind of update some of their, their taxonomies and terminology uh, that they use um, for this kind of work and, and just consider like more integrative perspectives and uh, for all these things that are treated separately. So anyway, that's kind of my two cents on that uh, reference they make. And um, so from there we get, um, you know, these kind of mini subsections uh, that relate active inference to just a broad variety of other fields, um, its relationships, its differences, um, because they're able to find kind of positive relationships between active inference and these other fields, it kind of opens the door for dialogue, uh, for you know, control theory, predictive processing, um, action control, cybernetics, idiomotor theory. It's, it's, I think it's, it's kind of, it's, it's doing exactly what it purports to do, which is to find an integrated perspective. Um, then that said, it distinguishes itself. Um, active inference is becoming its own kind of approach, framework, uh, body of knowledge. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's just kind of placing itself in the sort of in this epistemic field that we, we find ourselves within. And um, relationships with utility, decision making, reinforcement learning. So many people, I think, come to active inference in part because they want to study those things whenever they're not coming from a more neuroscientific background. And it's like, well, utility is kind of implicated in active inference, but but it's more than that. We have epistemic value, and we have balancing between epistemic and pragmatic value rather than treating them as their own separate cost functions or ignoring one of them or otherwise. And finally, the, the chapter points at sort of these other fields and open directions. Um, the idea of modeling social and cultural dynamics is a kind of broader scale application of active inference. Um, you could even presume that that goes down to the micro level that is, you know, we have human beings, individuals with their own generative models just interacting in a kind of multi-agent environment. And then from there, checking to see what are the emergent behaviors whenever they interact. And so what kind of kind of social dynamics happen, what kind of cultural creations and productions they, they come up with, um, things like that. So, um, I think I'll leave it there for now. There's just too much to go over. I won't give like a point by point, like here's the difference between active inference and, um, you know, reinforcement learning right away or something, but um, that's about a good stopping point, I think. So if anyone has any, you know, points of interest they want to talk about, any kind of questions, something on their mind, uh, please feel free to go for it. Uh, okay, I have, a, I have a more of a, it's, uh, yeah, I try to explain it in simple words. Like, have you seen this use of this word epistemic a lot and it can mean multiple things. What does the word epistemic mean in this, in the context of active inference? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll give that a shot. Um, so previously in the textbook, at times we would see, you know, we've seen different like kind of equations that break down computation of variational and expected free energies. And so we've seen how it can be broken down into word, like certain terms that, that have been given a name. So we have like risk, ambiguity, um, complexity, accuracy. So, so two of those terms that can be broken down into are pragmatic um, value and epistemic value. And uh, those are those are pretty essential. They relate to uh, a classic problem in the, in the social sciences called the, the explore exploit trade off. Um, but in simpler terms, pragmatic value 
as opposed to epi epistemic is something like an agent just going for realizing their goals directly. Like you're hungry, you want some food, you go for the food. Um, you know, realize that preference to, to, you know, diminish your hunger, keep your homeostasis <laughs> pretty aligned and balanced. Um, but epistemic value, meanwhile, would be acting in order to get more information in order to realize your goal. So again, you're hungry, you want some food. Well, where can I get food? Like maybe it's contextual. Where can I get food right now? Um, I, you can use the internet, search up what places are open, uh, what, what places are delivering, um, how much money do I have uh, currently and what's my budget? So it would basically just be kind of instrumentally you searching, seeking for information that can help you to realize a goal. So oftentimes whenever there are like behavioral experiments, like a kind of two arm bandit problem, for example, where an agent and uh, they can go to, uh, they have multiple actions available to them. They can go uh, immediately to uh, a reward, like pulling the slot machine at the, the end of the task. Or prior to that, they can go to a queue, like a CUE queue that will inform them uh, which slot machine to pull which one has the higher probability of giving them a payoff. And so the agent, um, you know, if the, if the agent doesn't care about the epistemic value, it could derive from the cue, uh, giving it the information of how to better realize its goal. It'll just skip the cue, go straight for pragmatic value, pull the slot machine, see if it wins. Um, so I, I, I hope that that was helpful. But I, yeah, I think that the simplest terms are epistemic is something like the knowing. It's the, it's the information that'll help you get to your goal. Pragmatic action and value are derived from, from actually going directly at the goal. So you collect enough info, you know what to do. After that, you go for the pragmatic value. Yeah. A little bit of just other broader pieces here. Epistem in contrast with belief, doxa, like a creed, also as distinguishing the, the knowledge from the creed from the technique, which is the basis of technology. Um, and then another helpful piece, like uh, Andrew mentioned, the epistemic pragmatic value. The epistemic value is like known unknowns in the prospective setting because it's a value ascertainment about a given policy, how much I expect to learn from that policy. So of course, if something you didn't expect to learn happened, it couldn't have been considered at the moment. So that would be an epistemic event, like in the broader sense of just epistemic meaning learning or knowledge. But when we're talking about expected free energy equation 2.6, epistemic value is specifically about expected information gain, which has to do with like how certain or uncertain the agent is in the moment. And then the epistemic chaining demo, um, which is just like one step. It's basically one step more detail than in the textbook, but um, you see the mouse navigate to the queue but this just kind of begets other questions, like how does it come to believe with, with full precision that the cue is informative? So this isn't the whole iguana, but this kind of isolates a situation where either a risky pragmatic decision can be approached immediately, or a little bit more of a circuitous path can be taken that results in information gain, results in observations that are expected to reduce uncertainty about where the preferred observations are. And then depending on how all the parameters are set, you could have an agent that just still goes and risk it, risks it for the uncertain reward sooner.
can we can we actually phrase it like uh, epistemic uh, value and epistemic capacity is like the potential of the possible things which can be done and the pragmatic thing is the actual thing that we do so it's like epi epistemic uh, values are like uh as the ground on which possible things can happen and pragmatic thing is the actual thing that you do like conversationally that might make sense but when you're talking when you say things that you could do that's basically affordances and affordances then can be evaluated in terms of their epistemic and pragmatic value but it isn't that something that you can do is related to the information gain of that action but i mean conversationally it makes sense like the broader epistemic concept the agent has to know what it could do yeah it has to be known what could be done so it's not that other terms are expunged of epistemic components it's just that epistemic value is being used in a pretty narrow way in equation 2.6 in the expected information gain that does mm -hmm. highlight something very important but you you could do kind of an epistemic inquiry into how does one know that they know and so on. Uh, sorry, just uh, uh, could you just uh, clearly differentiate between this with uh, affordances, which you said, I think. No, what I'm saying is like, so affordances is the possible things which a person can do at a particular moment of time, right? Exactly. Yeah, and policies like the the various policies you can do, but affordance is like at that specific moment of time, what the agent does, that's basically the affordances. So affordance is very context uh, sensitive. Yeah, affordances are actions that can be taken in a moment. Policies are affordances over the time horizon of planning. So if the time horizon of planning is just one, then the policy space is the affordance space. If you're talking about a time horizon of two, the policy space pi, the list or vector pi that sums to one, if you're talking about a time horizon of two, is going to be the length of affordances squared. So like up, down, left, right, in the moment, affordances. And then planning horizon of two, so the policy space of which consideration is happening in would be 16. And then each of those 16 is going to have a prior. So how likely right. is it a priori? And then if it gets updated by expected free energy, it's going to get updated according to the information gain and the pragmatic value of each of those policies. Where did you get the number 16? Like four into four? Four squared. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's the kind of just like, it's like a chess algorithm. Like the first pass approach is just to expand your policy space exponentially. But then if you have more than a couple of affordances at each time step, or you go more than a couple of time steps deep, the space of the policy vector becomes huge. And then that necessitates all these different approaches to dealing with large policy spaces, ranging from like pruning of policy trees to setting up the problem a little bit differently so that the branching is less exponential. So here's the narrow epistemic value concept. Just KL divergence, fancy E, big expectation of KL divergence between RQ, variational approximation of hidden states through time, conditioned upon in both sides the action. Everything is conditioned upon the action. And the only difference is Y tilde. So for that action, how much will those observations coming in update my beliefs about hidden states through time? If the observations are expected to be moot, then the information gain is low. 
because it's like it might as well not be here. If you expect there to be an observation coming in that's super informative, then this is going to be a large divergence. And that's kind of perfectly partitioned away from whether those observations coming in are aligned with what you expect and prefer to see. Like pulling a slot machine. Like, I mean, th th there's, there's a lot of ways to go with this, but like you can imagine there's two agents, they're both pulling a slot machine. One of them is doing it, picking that policy because they're seeking the information that the slot machine provides next. Another one is doing it because they believe that it's going to come up in a favorable setting for them. So that's kind of something people are exploring with the precision psychiatry would be, okay, this person's engaged in this repetitive behavior. Is it because it's simply a habit and they don't prefer to do it? Is this happening because they actually prefer the outcome that it reaches? Is this happening because they prefer an outcome and they've misunderstood the consequences of the action? So they think that that action is going to reach their desired outcome. But those from the outside look exactly the same. Hence designing like experiments and cognitive models that could differentiate why those are different. Uh, I have uh, one question. Could you please go back to that last equation which is showing? Yeah, over here, actually, I don't know what this, what does the, the term mean? This Q, the last one, that, that what is the operator equal to and a triangle on top? Any idea? Defined as equal to. Okay, defined as e equal, equal to. by definition to. Equal by definition to. Like, this is the joint distribution. So here's Q. That's our variational approximator that we control. This is a joint distribution of X and Y conditioned upon pi. So it's like there's kind of an X and a Y field. And we're making a probability density over the X and the Y field conditioned upon what action we're selecting. And then that is defined as the joint product of our beliefs about hidden state given policy multiplied by basically the A matrix, the real mapping between hidden states and observations. So here's the here's our, our big underlying joint generative model of the true temperature in the room and the thermometer reading conditioned upon policy. And we're going to be able to break that down into well, what is the temperature of the room given our policy? And then what is the thermometer reading given the true temperature of the room? Because of the factorizability, the, the fact that the X and the Y were orthogonal gives us a sparsity that we can leverage to decompose the joint distribution into these two simpler distributions.
Yeah, that's quite a thread there. <laughs> it's like, I've forgotten more than I'll ever know. <laughs> Just like, how did this happen? <laughs> yeah. Deny the meaning of awareness. Oh. Hmm. That's, um, I do recommend, I cannot remember the name of the paper, but there's like this classic Marvin Minsky paper where he's describing his take on AI at the time. This must be decades ago at this point. And at the end, he hints at the idea that uh, and some kind of artificial intelligence would have to have a model of itself. And I just remember skimming that paper and then looking at active inference and this idea that one has to have their own model the, of, of themselves in the world in order to kind of maintain that that markup blanket, maintain that separation between self and others so that you can actually <laughs> maintain your own homeostasis, uh, maintain that um, division between between model and, and, and environment. Uh, kind of rambling. On yeah, that. Well, and, and like like we're aware of making decisions on top of what we're not aware of we're able to talk about the semantics of like moving our hand around because there's this kind of infrastructural component that we're not generally aware of hmm. they call it self-evidencing right yeah well self-evidencing let's see where it comes up Self-evidencing is provided as something like the analogy to reward maximizing, which puts reward maximization as the unified imperative in active inference, where we have surprise minimization or surprise bounding about one's generative model as the kind of key component. We can think about, as I say, one existential imperative, self-evidencing. But solipsism is kind of a um, dead-end strategy. So self-evidencing doesn't just mean observing oneself, because over long enough timelines, that ends up becoming maladaptive. So that's kind of like, well, how could novelty or creativity or aesthetics be brought in when the unifying principle that underlies behavior is to glean evidence for one's model as it is. This is funny also like in chapter 10, now to come back to the preface. So this is, I guess, written by Carl. It's not just about reading. The free energy principle equates existence with self-evidencing. Can I uh, tell a joke? Like, I don't know, it's a joke or something. They they said that like all these people, this uh, they're just worried about that the mind will just shut off, you know, like, They'll not do any self-evidencing, and then uh, no, nobody wants to do that. Something that is like, more, like, like the greatest fear among many people is that okay, they just don't want them. They're just worried about that the mind will shut off one day, and there'll be no self-evidencing, and everything will go at us. You know, all this kind of stuff. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> Hmm. Sorry, my level of jokes are with my kids, like the way I speak with my kids. That is the level of jokes I know. I don't know better ones. So. That's the sweet spot for humor, though. It's like three to six years. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a strongly reinforced theme that simple on through complex systems are self-evidencing 
to garner sensory data consistent with an internal model. So it's like in the reward world, we'd have some temperature distribution, and then we have a second layer distribution on top of temperature, how rewarding those temperatures are. And then we pursue rewarding temperatures like body temperature. In the self-evidencing world, we have our basal distribution of temperature. And then it's just explained as action is taken to continually sample from that distribution of preferred temperatures. Whereas reward, you need to interpose with like another layer in between the temperature and the action. So you're, you have temperature and then reward layer, and then you're taking actions based upon reward of different actions. Here, we have the basal temperature layer, and then we're taking actions directly on that distribution. Um. Can I, can I give a perspective uh, of self-evidencing as it relates to meditation? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I'm in the right track, uh, but like there will be more learnings, but self-evidencing, like it's actually self-evidence is, there is a, there's actually an opposing force between self-evidencing and meditation basically, because self-evidencing is you want to, and that's how I'm thinking. Like, we know ourselves by the evidences which are provided from outside. That is, we are inferring our evidences from the knowledge from outside. And um, meditation is trying to see what is really inside. So, and and then there is one more this concept, marvelous concept of blankets, right? So it's conditional independence. You, 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 you the more you know about the outside world if you know the blanket states doesn't mean that you know more about the inside world and that's like a, that's that's like I, I have just fallen in love with this fundamental concept like even if you know so much about the external world but if the blanket states are just this much then knowing more about the external world doesn't know more about yourself so self-evidencing has its limits and uh, yeah so there is a there is some kind of a dynamic interplay. So, but but what I think is this 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 formulations and this concepts of active inference can let us know so much about the mind and how it works. Uh, but there will be there. I don't know much, but like there will be challenges when we explore um, the realms beyond the mind. It's the consciousness. So, so I don't want to talk about that because. People can say and they can have a lot of theories, but it may not necessarily be right because this conditional uh, bound by this Marco Blanc blanket uh, presents a very fundamental. Um, that's uh, that's like I, I don't know if I phrased it appropriately, but like that is like this. These two pillars are what I'm basically thinking and how it relates to meditation and these concepts. Yeah. Yeah, it makes me think of. Uh, I don't know if this directly relates to what you were describing but this whole you know just because you might know a lot about the outside doesn't necessarily mean you know a lot about the inside and it makes me think about you know similar to the rest of of kind of current research in neuroscience uh active inference also splits up uh when describing different sensory modalities as you know we don't just have like one kind we have proprioception and exteroception and interoception and all three of them relate to inference and kind of having to you know update beliefs change your attention um and and, and kind of figure out what to do and so interoception means like reading your own body and reading your own feelings even this this chapter 10 here relates um there's like a section entire section that relates to like emotion um in in trying to describe that right like you have to actually infer how you're feeling you don't just automatically you know perfectly precisely know and then suddenly an um, emotion isn't so much like some kind of 
innate, perfectly understood, inbuilt thing that we just automatically like understand. Like, oh, I'm sad. It's like no, you have to infer that. You have to like read what's going on inside of you just as much as you have to read what's going on outside of you. So suddenly your emotion is yeah, it's like a hypothesis of like oh, based on this feeling and this and this and this other sensory information that I'm getting from within me, like, how am I feeling? How am I doing? Let's put a conceptual, you know, word on that name of some emotion. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, Christoph, you have uh, your hand up. Uh, yeah, I just posted a link uh, to a talk by uh, Shamil uh Chandaria, I think he's affiliated with University of Oxford and a bunch of other places. And it's uh, um, non-dual awakening, yeah, uh, computational neurophenomenological account, uh, which is basically entirely based on the free energy principle, active inference. And it's an it's an incredible talk. It's the best summary of um, essentially various aspects of spiritual practice from the perspective of computational neuroscience that they have ever encountered. And it's, it's really, really, it, he goes really, really deep. Um, I can tell you, like, from, from my perspective, um, understanding the free energy principle, um, has been enlightening to, to, to say the least, like in, in the, in, in the, for me, it's actually in the literal sense. There's a concept in Buddhism, which I, I believe is, uh, liberation by view, um, where, um, you know, a big or, or, or a practitioner, um, receives a, a certain level of, 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 of liberation by essentially understanding um, um, certain truths about the nature of reality without necessarily realizing um, uh, for themselves a, 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 a certain meditative attainments which are um, available to practitioners in the path of insight. So if you practice mindfulness and concentration, there is a whole ladder of um, uh, insights that you you essentially climb you know the 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 four jhanas the the form the formless realms and finally the attainment of arahantship and i find it that when i look at the teachings of the buddha particularly um you know say reading the nikayas the majjhima nikaya the middle length discourses or um samyutta nikaya the connected discourses and thinking about them in terms of um free energy principle and active inference um the teachings of the buddha are incredibly clear like he is giving you recognition models, he's giving uh, you means of building your own um, uh, generative models, and it has a lot to do with essentially making the phenomena that happen in the mind opaque, because normally they're transparent to us. We don't know how they work. We don't know how the reality is uh, constructed by the mind. We are not aware um, of causes and effects that give rise to certain thoughts and feelings and and perceptions and and mental formations and concoctions and, and all these other things, and Buddha is giving you essentially a vocabulary, so that you can um, later on uh, label these things as they occur. So he's giving you a recognition model. You can say like, ah, this is a this is a perception, this is a mental formation, this is a feeling, and feeling is born of contact, and contact is you know between the internal sense bases and the external sense bases, and so on and so forth. And then it that's for the purpose of effectively building a generative model. Um, once you have the generative model, then you know you you get you become you can become more introspective about your own experience, and. Um, the the goal of that is that your experience becomes increasingly uh, opaque uh you see more aspects of it and so on and so forth and uh at the end of the path you basically have complete insight into how the reality is constructed by the mind and that's why this phrase always um uh, recurs in, in in the buddhist text that you know um um the, the bhikkhu who completed the path understands the, the 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 birth is destroyed the holy life has been lived what 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 had to be done has been done and there is no more coming in, in, into any state of being it's not a it's not a matter of you know question like once you, once you get there you know you, you know you're there so you know like it's um i, I think I, I think there is a that you know going back to this earlier statement about the necessity of updating uh, the terminology and taxonomy once you start looking at, at, at Buddhist teachings through this perspective, and if you look at this through this modern perspective of computational neuroscience, it's, it's it's an incredible manual, and it's so straightforward. There is no there is no um, there is no doubt about what you need to do and how how to do it. 
So I, I highly recommend um, this talk, and uh, you know, it's a it's it's a very fruitful uh, area of inquiry. Awesome, Francis. Thanks. Uh, firstly, uh, I, I'd endorse that. Uh, thanks for um, pointing it out to me, Christoph. Uh, I uh, watched it twice. Uh, I'm sure I've still got a hell of a lot more to get out of it. Um, it's a, a really interesting. Um, secondly, just a uh, kind of a related um to a very simple but it struck me as interesting point uh, which relates to the whole idea of making the transparent uh, opaque um, and the fact that by making it opaque you can see it <laughs> which of course sounds a little paradoxical um, I've been thinking about um, mindfulness and kind of phenomenology because it's really hard phenomenology, you know, what is it that we're feeling with this stuff that we're not normally aware of? And of course, a common mindfulness technique is to label your thoughts. And of course, we normally think of that as, oh, we're labeling them because we want to then let them go. But of course, by labeling them, you make them opaque and you could get a very good stream of consciousness um, uh, by just speaking these labels aloud um, by pursuing the uh, pursuit of mindfulness and of the empty mind you actually become aware of what's in the mind and then um, the third thing uh, uh, just kind of going back to this uh, homeostasis interoception um, and there's something perhaps even simpler uh, which is when I was first started studying to be a counsellor I was introduced to uh, Kolb's uh, learning loop uh, KOLB and that has four axes which are and it's kind of used in an educational context. And uh, they have these kind of rather long labels, but then there's another variation where the four axes have one word labels and the labels would be uh, action, feeling, thought, planning. And that I've explained, that kind of gives us a model of how we process our feelings. Um, and I explain it to people in a counseling context, you know, why is it count counselors are always asking you how this makes you feel, how you feel about this. But, you know, we've got this engine, this cognitive engine up here, but how do we know what's steering it? What's the point? Our feelings are where the rubber hits the road, the road being our well-being. If we don't know how we're feeling, we don't know what to do with our cognition. Um, and as you get further away from basic biological homeostasis, homeostatic demands, the biological needs, uh, it gets harder and harder to engage with our more complex inner needs, demands between say status and connection. Uh, should I pursue a job or should I make time for being with my partner? Uh, and especially when you enter this uh, existential anomaly, all this brain power, cognitive power, helps to increase our survival. That's what it's there for. But what happens when we get so much cognitive power that we realize that none of the 
all, the, all our paths lead to non-survival in the end. And we enter the existential challenge. Dump, mind dump there. Can I just add something about labeling um, that uh, popped in my mind um, as, as we were speaking? Uh, so that's there is a there, the, that's Mahasi Saidao's tradition um, uh, is essentially to just practice labeling all day long. So you just label everything you do. But um, I found I found I found this, uh, really there's this inter really interesting paper um, from the deep learning community called "Your Classifier Is." secretly an energy-based model and you should treat it as such. And um, I think it's by Will Gradwolf. Uh, Gradwolf. Uh, I'm not sure what the surname is, but anyway, so they show that if you train, um, you know, standard classifier trained on uh, cross uh, entropy objective, like typical, you know, MNIST classifier neural network, there is a way of interpreting that as a energy-based model in such a way that you get effectively the kind of unnormalized probabilities that are required to compute free energy. And you effectively get um, uh, a generative model for free. So this idea you know, of labeling by Mahasi Sayadaw and, and, and other traditions in Buddhism that all you have to do is labeling, it's actually, uh, you know, if you squint your eyes at this paper and you say like, you know, learning is kind of a universal and no matter how it's implemented, the, the same sort of effects uh, take place. You are, that, that, that is exactly the way to build a generative model. Um, which I find, I find it, I, I think this, this formal equivalence between uh, classification, uh, uh, you know, the recognition and gener generative models through energy-based models specifically, which is just such a beautiful and, and rich, um, formalism, especially, and, and so connected to, to active inference, um, that's going to be, um, it is going to be important. So I, I think this is a very, uh, very interesting uh, research avenue of how to connect active inference with um, this deep learning world. And in some sense, you know, like the, because active inference and free energy are so universal phenomena, we, we know for, for this argument that because they apply to anything that exists mathematically a priori, then these these systems must be building models in the Bayesian sense from a certain perspective, but it seems that that equivalence is a lot deeper and much more direct than just um, you know this kind of this is a mathematical principle that has to be true kind of argument. It actually can, can be shown how uh, how that happens. So uh, yeah, uh, fascinating paper. I highly recommend it. Yeah, super cool. It's fascinating to see just like with this, the integrative approach of this last chapter, how many possible topics we could land on during this conversation from, from deep learning, mathematical formalisms, uh, the excesses of the, the human cognitive mind. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I, I personally just I find this kind of first principles approach of act, active inference to just open doors to many different dialogues. Um, and Francis, I was finding that to be very interesting. I had like a a kind of naive take on uh, the idea of like what what happens whenever you start getting away from like apparent homeostatic needs um, from an active perspective which is you know from a, a modeling perspective we're looking at like an agent has their preferences uh which are really their their expectations uh about preferences and and so there are things that you expect more to occur um and those those are you know your your wants your needs and so on might be some kind of colloquial language we could assign to those uh, priors or uh, those preferences and like the idea might be that as a human being navigates the world going forward an increasingly more complex world you know they they start to learn that they need to do things beyond simply oh I need to drink water to satiate thirst um, 
like a variety of things, navigating a kind of legal, financial, social, occupational, familial world that they're in. And it, it's almost like there's this kind of expansion of, uh, of the state space to learn about. And uh, with that, a kind of expansion of observations or preferences to be realized in order to, to meet our wants and our, our needs. And, and, and so to bring it back to this discrepancy between like, oh, just keeping your heartbeat uh, regulated, keeping your, your hydration levels reasonable, like suddenly there are all kinds of things. I want a nice house and I want a, I want a nice car or, or conversely, I, I want to have a very energy efficient <laughs> uh, green uh, lifestyle uh, or, or some such thing. And, and, and as it becomes more complex, it's like, it just makes me think of uh, this classic Rolling Stones song, uh, you can't always get what you want. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can get what you need. Um, it also brings me back to Buddhism and a lot of commentary upon the role of, of desire and its relation with, with suffering. Um, just kind of, you know, let, desire can ultimately be, be limitless. It can be transient. Uh, it, it can be something that sort of leads you astray from the path. Uh, it can be all kinds of things. And yeah, I don't know. And I don't know if it's about kind of reining in our, our desires every once in a while and really evaluating like what is important here. Uh, what do we really need to do? Um, and, and how can we, how can we have our basic needs met? And then from there, I look at like, look to neuroscience and uh, folks like um, there's someone named Fel, uh, Sarah Feldman Barrett. She's great. She's done a lot of work on uh, uh, emotion and affect. And, and she's at least a couple of times had some collaboration with Carl Friston and other folks in active inference. Um, and she says like, sometimes you just need some good sleep. <laughs> some, sometimes whenever there's a, a kind of overwhelmingness, a kind of, you begin to interpret what's going on with you as like anxiety, uh, you know, in, in the extremes, a kind of catastrophic thinking of trying to do everything all at once. You can imagine an active inference agent trying to just minimize a ton of free energy all at one time, and it cannot find the right policy to, to accomplish that within five seconds, as much as it might wish that such a thing were possible um yeah it's really just you know get some good sleep can you do that and you know get some get some good nutrients in your body and maybe get at whatever kind of exercise is reasonable to you if, if only like a nice walk um apparently that can heavily change the the inferential process uh and maybe can help with straightening out thinking um i could ramble on forever but yeah i'm just kind of a uh, wrapping up the the meeting here some thoughts throwing them all around um i have to leave in one minute because i've got a client to, uh on the hour uh, can i just uh say yes just please very thank you so much and there's so much more i'd love to say and to talk about uh and i'm really sorry that we've come to our last session yes for this little fractal cycle but we will all be able to suffer more looking at POMDPs in the future. <laughs> I'll be there with luck. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank Bye you. Well. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Like cool. It's... Okay. Next week, um, we'll we'll just see what happens. We can um, fill out the feedback form anonymously look through some of these many comments. And also I think now that we are two years after the, the publishing of this book, March uh, 22, we can start to think about, you know, we have RX and Fur, we have all these other activities. How, how do we want to continue with the PAR textbook group? So think about it over the next week and then we'll discuss more later. later. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Thank Peace. You. Thanks, everybody. It's been amazing. Yay. Absolutely. Bye. Thanks, folks.